Hopefully we understand at least that first sentence and what that means. So hopefully we can get through that. Um, basic focus we're going to be going through. Hopefully when the AV gets the, yeah. Basic focus we're going to be going through today is uh, talking a little bit about the efforts to aggregate distributed energy resources and the efforts at the transmission level really to understand, as well as a little bit on the distribution level, to understand how distributed energy resources will affect the system, how those can be integrated into more traditional markets, and what the effects that'll, that, will happen, uh, that will bring about in the next several years. Um, definitely has been brought to the forefront in the last few weeks as the kind of final draft proposal for um, California ISO has come out on there. I'm going to call it the ERP to be nice to the, to the acronym. Um, plans as well as some very, very early discussions uh, from ERCOT in preparation for the September white paper on this topic. Uh, but just jumping into it, I'm joined by uh, David Haig, Senior Director of Marketing and Technology Partnerships with M&W Group. Meet Kunkar, the Senior Director of Strategic Initiatives at Enphase Energy. Joel Mickey, the Director of Market Design and Development uh, with ERCOT, as well as Bud Voss, the President and CEO of Imbala Net Networks. So to get us started, because uh, I'd imagine just getting a nice baseline on speaking about distributed energy resources, and that imp implies a fair number, a fair range of resources, but can anything from residential to CNI? What's kind of the interaction of those resources with the markets today, the actual energy markets at the transmission level? So I don't know, Dave, if you want to start us off. Sure. I, I mean, the, I'd, I'd say the simple answer to that is, is not much. Um, and, uh, you know, right, right now in the marketplace, there's a lot of pilot programs that are, uh, that are in place between utilities, utilities and customers with various... Uh, you know, various demand uh, management programs, but you can't build a business model around a pilot program. So, uh, you know, there are uh, just, you know, the market is just very nascent, and so we're, we're trying to track and manage what pilot programs are out and how, they're, how they may or may not evolve into full-fledged programs. You know, I think that's, that's, that's right. Um, hey, is it on? Can you hear me? Okay. Hear me now? Yes. All right, great. Um, I think that's right. Where it's, there isn't a market today, I think, to the extent that, you know, Cal ISO came up with the, the DERP. Uh, that's a start. New York's looking at it. Or God, of course. Uh, I think kind of one way to also think about it is uh, how do you define a market, right? I mean, there is a there is the wholesale market, which is what we're talking about, but then there is a question of is the distribution level a market? Uh, because a lot of the services, and I know we'll get into this later on, but a lot of the services that the distributed resources can offer and benefits uh, is at the distribution level. And that is very much at a pilot phase of figuring out how we do this. So I think it's moving in that direction, but uh, you know, there's still a long way to go. So just to jump ahead a little bit into what, what's currently being talked about, Joel, you guys are diligently looking at this. It's not something that's going to happen tomorrow in Texas, but looking at getting ahead of things. Um, for you right now, what's kind of the size, the profiles, what, what's causing you to focus on this right now, on what resources you're concerned about in the future? Well, first of all, it's because of my, um, my charge at ERCOT being uh, Director of Market Design and Development. I'm looking for things in the future that are, that are gonna cause a problem, not things that are causing a, us a problem today. And you know we can look at Germany, we can look at Hawaii, we can look at Spain, we can look at California, and we can see problems that are, or uh, you know I don't want to say it's always problems. It's we can see uh, opportunities and things we can learn from that we don't need to repeat. And I would rather um, you know not put a bandaid on something that, you know when I get a scratch, but figure out why I got scratched in the first place, and and deal with that. And so we hope to be proactive instead of reactive. And as an example to your first question, um, a few months ago we had a, an uh, issue in our, in our South Valley area down by Mexico that's kind of a weak part of the system. And there is some distributed energy resources currently down there that you know, we are not able to, to see or to use because they're behind the meter and they're not registered. 
but they could actually help out. We could have had less of a low shed event down there if you know we had the right way of being able to uh, utilize them. And so we see those kind of real world examples and want to get ahead of that. Yeah, and for those who are actually a, a meet, this is something you guys are very familiar with because looking mostly at residential markets, that profile is a lot different for a lot of areas around the country, especially in Texas where the residential market is not nearly as robust. It's not going to be a, a tremendous focus, you know, please comment Joel if I'm wrong on this, on focusing on those 5KB systems for a while. Um, but there are some test beds that you guys are looking at that actually really matters for the utilities. Cameron, kind of some of the kind of work and focus, because HECO doesn't have an ISO. There isn't that overarching transmission authority because there's not a big enough, mar uh, big enough area to do that. Kind of what does that look like for you guys, first steps with the distribution utility? Yeah, so I think, uh, I mean, HECO is very unique for a variety of reasons, right? I mean, they have the highest level of penetration. It's kind of the transmission distribution all, all together. Uh, and the amount of penetration there actually does make it meaningful. So to your point, kind of, you know, it's different by different parts of the country, but uh, I think total solar for the size of, you know, on Oahu, it, it truly gets to a point where on a barely over a gigawatt of a grid, total grid, it can make a huge difference if you can actually participate and in some way use these distributed assets to provide services. And whether it is, you know, you can do regulation services, which is a little bit more difficult, you can do capacity, uh, but also at that point, start providing certain, I kind of keep coming back to it, but the, the distribution level services. Uh, how, how can you provide voltage support uh, where there is high level of penetration? Again, they're trying to figure it out. We're trying to figure it out where it doesn't truly exist as a, how do you get compensated for it? The system owners, the technology providers. Uh, California is trying to figure that out with the whole DRP proceedings and the various things going on right now. Uh, I think it's great that ERCOT and, and Texas is looking at it ahead of time to say, hey, before we get to that point of high level of penetration, how do we, how do we get into it? How do we make sure we structure it in the right way so that we end up, you know, we all of a sudden are not caught off guard? So there's a variety of things on actually enabling additional revenue streams or creating a little bit more certainty in the market that I want to get to in the next few questions. But I'll just to start us off, you, got, you work with a lot of CNI customers. Um, focus on a lot of different resources. When it comes down to providing some certainty and some focus, some ability to actually have the optimization software have some value stream that's going to be there one way or another. It doesn't matter if there's an IT, ITC credit. It doesn't matter if there's uh, an adjustment in a grant program or something like that. How's that looking in discussions you have, either with um, aggregator customers you have or with some of the CNI customers you've traditionally worked with? Check, check, the, uh, check the actual box. You might have it off. The box off. Yeah, they, they click off a little bit easy. Top. How about now? Now? No? Not at all. Broken mic. We'll get it. It's number seven. Okay. There we go. What do you know? <laughs> oh, it's just like a demand response event. You never know when it's going to end. <laughs> You're fine. <laughs> uh, so uh, I would say, to, to come back to your question, I mean, when we work with our customers, certainty is a big, is a big part of the equation. And, uh, you know, we can certainly take either commercial customers or through energy service providers, and we can look at how we dissect the data and give a good prediction and estimate. Uh, but certainly it comes down to what are you doing on that single day. So for us, a lot of it is about data. It's about data, it's about integrating that data and actually providing full transparency and information back to our customers so that they understand how to either change their operating procedures, understand how they augment their processes in order to continue to get that revenue piece if that's the way they're actually playing in the market. Um, by the way, I would say that I think that uh, this market is typically operated without a lot of transparency sometimes, particularly if we look at some of the older demand response markets or kind of load shedding markets there wasn't a level of transparency. It was, here's your check, have a good afternoon. Um, we actually operate much more intimately with our customers where we'll show them the second by second data as to why a particular asset didn't perform, wasn't in the market, didn't get monetized, or why it did, and then actually work with them to, to make improvements on that. It's a big focus of the kind of after, after the implementation part of bringing these assets into the market. 
This actually brings up what I think is one of the more interesting things for, for people who have been in the industry for a while. How is this actually different? I mean, we've had demand response programs for a long time, some of which have been more advanced than others, some of which have been more monitored than others. You know, Joel, when you're looking at this and when you're thinking about these questions, how does that fit in with, I mean, you guys have some existing demand response programs. How is that fitting in with the existing structure? Is it something that's going to be molded together, kept separate? Yeah. Well, I think, um, you know, currently we do have some of our, uh, there, it, some of our dam demand response is on the 12 kV and 35 kV network. Um, but when I, you know, we've, you've, over the last few days we've talked about what's the definition of deer or dir and how do we even pronounce it right. Um, my definition is it is all DR, it is, you know, generation or um, any combination batteries, anything, it's just in the distribution system. And um, uh, when we look at the solution to that, it's we're trying to be technology agnostic. So it's not whether you're going to reduce three megawatts of load or if you're going to, you know, start a micro turbine that has three megawatts, or it, it doesn't matter what it is, you're going to be changing your behavior, which we're going to see the net result of. And so we're not really worried about the technology, I guess, right now. Yeah. So in, in bringing that together, if you're thinking of bringing those two sides together, the traditional with the new, are there any technological changes? Are there any requirements that you're, and I, I realize it's early, right? But what kind of requirements are you looking at? Maybe not exact uh, details. Mm -hmm. Well, I think the main thing is we're assuming, you know, we're not trying to predict when there's going to be a certain percentage of uh, deers in, this, in the system. We're looking more as, is it going to happen? And is it going to be significant? And I think everybody in this room probably does think it's going to happen and does hope or think it's going to be significant. So we're along that same line. And again, we want to get ahead of it. So we're, um, we think the best way to solve this is, is not to have some kind of you know, trip something or send a red light to somebody to turn on. It's, it's give them the price signal that we give all of our wholesale market participants. And so one of the key components of our, our white paper will be to suggest that we start having a, a basically a locational marginal price at every point of injection in our system and, and maybe even extending that to the, the feeder if needed and have the TSP have um, some way of affecting that price. So let's say we have a, you know, our, our current price can go to $9,000. Let's say we're in a, in a period where we're, where we're scarce. Just to clarify something, TSP, Transmission Service Provider, right? Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Just, yeah, too many acronyms, I know. <laughs> but let's say that uh, we've got a price signal that we're, you know, we're short megawatts, so our price is up to cap 9,000 megawatts. But some of those distributed energy resources are burning down a, a 12 kV circuit. Instead of having that transmission service provider trip, you know, one or many of those, uh, those deers off by, you know, manual control, I'd say we just have a loop in there where they can, that price on that feeder can drop to zero or negative or whatever makes sense, and they get that signal and they follow it. And I think that'd be a lot smoother way of dealing with it than, um, than some kind of manual control. Yeah. Ben, if I, it just, I wanted to just add one interesting thing, which is this trend, right? So I think what you're asking about is the trend of the market moving towards this very fast, but it's still considered a demand type, demand response type program. Um, I don't know if you're familiar or how many in the audience are familiar with the programs that Ontario had just finished their RFP procurement on, which was a, a five-minute demand response product. Um, five-minute call, five-minute action. But you're not going to do that with a light. You're not going to do that with a phone call. Um, you need automation. And I think that's the general trend that I see is that it's still demand response. We're still going to have you know, many, 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 many gigawatts of demand response, but it's going to begin to morph, and it's going to begin to morph into these very automated, highly... Uh, variable resources mm -hmm. that can that can operate in markets like this. When it comes into a strong question of how much needs to move to which market, when what type of pricing is available in each market to uh, move those around, so Absolutely. how much will be automated. Um, one thing that, and this is this is the toughest question, so you know, David, David, and me get a little screwed on this one because um, I definitely want both your thoughts. Uh, one of the comments made um, by Tom Bialik in the uh, executive council meeting was around, you know, what's in it for us right now? If we got our ISOs are getting ahead of things and, and starting to get through things, if those structures are put in place, it's a tough question because this is crystal ball stuff. 
how does a distribution utility try to leverage some of these services? If somebody's, if somebody's logged into an ERCOT program or a CAISO program, what does that look like right now? I, I think it's a, it's a great question. Um, you know, I think the market is currently is kind of at a very high level segmented between ISO distribution and end customer, maybe, maybe include generation in there somehow, um, but, but not for this, this conversation. Uh, you know, in the, in, the, in the degree in which a uh, distribution utility has strain on their grid, I think, is the degree in which they are uh, benefiting, but how that converts into economics and how that uh, converts into a recognition of profit for distribution uh, uh, utilities is, you know, I, I think it's, it's, it will be, you know, hashed out in one of the dozens and dozens of uh, policy initiatives on the docket right now. So it's looking at things like DRP and actually getting something set up where they can actually provide a, a monetary signal that may be either competing or work together in some way. Um, but it's, a, it's about 15 different things coming together in California. Yeah, exactly. I think in California right now there's you know, 20, 27 things on the docket. Yeah. It, it, so. And I think it, it, it changes also by uh, type of resource as well as uh, how are you bidding into the market, right? So I think the type of resource was something like storage. Uh, I think there's a very powerful use case for the ISO level kind of, you know, there's capacity, you can do frequency regulation, et cetera. I think for something like, like solar, it might be more about how do you manage uh, the, the intermittency or how do you manage some of the kind of voltage issues, right? Now, both can also play a little bit of a role, but I think it will evolve on what type of resource, because again, the markets today, the ISO markets are, the way of thinking about it is always from a load perspective. Even storage acts like a load. Uh, how do you now accommodate for a generation, which is what solar brings to the table? That's completely different, hasn't been thought about. Uh, and I think you have to, at, to some extent, go a little bit to the commercial sector where some of the services that commercial enterprises where you have to maintain a certain kind of power quality as a, as a, as a user, or you get penalized for it, if you flip it around and if you're providing certain amount of kind of power factor or power quality for a distribution, that's an ongoing requirement. And then you bid into the market based on kind of certain signals. Or the, it's a crystal ball, but I think we'll kind of have to look at, diff it's not one resource, the resources are different, we have to kind of recognize that. Uh, and there might be different models to draw upon as it's not always a signal and bidding, but are there different ways to actually target this? Yeah, and it seems like that's something that's not hashed out yet, but it seems like the interaction between NISO and the DSOs, that's the one state that's looking at it from that, a little bit more of that distribution perspective and trying to wrap it up. Uh, guidance is a little thin. <laughs> that, no, and that's that's absolutely correct. You know, and uh, you know where where we, you know where we see real initiatives, at least on the energy storage side, currently is California and and um, you know and PJM and some nice sort of, uh, but you know real real programs with real benefits are we're still a little thin in the market. Um, you know, you know, and then you know kind of beyond that. The uh, distribution, you know, I, I, my sense is the distribution utilities are a little bit thinner on the integrity of their telemetry compared to ISOs or uh, end users who care. Um, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm curious to see if other panelists have thoughts on, on that as well. But I will leave you to ask the questions. Yeah. Well, everyone has a comment. I, I, you know, I... I guess I would disagree a little bit. I, I would say that our, our utility customer base is as rigorous as our ISO customer base. Yeah. In fact, most of them look at the ISO rules and look at what's been set up at the ISOs and begin to just mimic those. So um, I think it may vary by technology, but at least in the world that I've operated in, uh, very, very fast resources, uh, when you're doing something like frequency or you're doing something like non-spin reserve, it's pretty critical to the integrity of the system that that become you know just as good as anything as generation. And see that may actually be one of the keys in this, just to segment this out a little bit. Behavioral demand response programs, which are not what you deal with ever, right? 
you talk about those types of things where there's, it's more of a give me everything you got, whatever you get, I, I'll take. Yeah. Um, and yeah, there's a lot of analytics to get it down where you have a band that you think is going to come out, but those types of programs aren't going to be anywhere near this, any type of DERP, any type of discussion around aggregation of stream energy resources. Those will remain, I would imagine that everybody's thought is those will remain separate in a different, dot, uh, different group. Yeah, I mean, I think you'll, you'll continue to see the markets evolve. You'll, there will always be a place for what you might call voluntary, voluntary demand response programs mm -hmm. or voluntary load shedding programs. Um, but let's understand what that is. It's, it's, a, it's a day ahead product that may or may not be counted upon by the people who run the grid. Um, we certainly find in a lot of our conversations with utilities that um, they're always looking for how does demand response become what they call the big boy resource, right? Because historically, load shedding and those types of programs have not met the needs of being a big boy resource. I can't call on it like generation, right? That's their view. So there'll always be a place for it. It's part of the resource mix, just like generation. We have a resource mix. Um, the real question is how, how is it going to evolve over time? And will there be innovation by providers who maybe have captured the hearts and minds of those customers through voluntary programs to convert them over to automated programs? I think that's where we get into some really interesting product innovation ideas and how do we go resell the customer on a mm -hmm. newer demand response program. We, we go back to it's, it is about the customer and how we bring them into this evolving landscape. And uh, I think we'll see a lot of innovation there, uh, by the way, particularly on the residential side, which is not my area, but I think it's a fascinating place where innovation will become huge uh, to bring people into this new world. Yeah. I think the key over there is that the automation, the data, the communications, a lot of that already exists. Right on, on the especially kind of the, the space we know the best from a residential perspective, uh, you know there there is data that exists on on solar production on even even from a utility standpoint right meters are starting to do more and more so there's almost a question also of you know is it is it the traditional baselining method or do you start doing more of a actually measuring submetering and is that the way and I think that's in the Cal ISO derp yeah. kind of ruling as well, which is you can start going more towards submetering and using that for the measurement and validation as opposed to the more traditional methods of baselining. So it, there is more connectivity, there is more data, and so I think evolving to more of the automated and actual measurement, I, I see that as kind of evolving faster. Yeah, I mean, that's literally the first requirement they put in there is... Yeah. It's a, it's a, I think the actual docket literally has metering and telemetry as the three of the six words that title it, so yeah. Well, the interesting thing is that they actually, uh, they, they gave a little bit of a pass on the telemetry where it is not kind of requiring some of the more traditional kind of AGC signals or things like that. So, but the metering side, they actually said you need a sub-metering, so. Yeah. Which actually all plays well to the distributed resources. Yeah. yeah. Uh, to add to that, I mean, I think that's the direction NERCOT is instead of having demand response programs where there's maybe a capacity payment or some kind of payment to, to give you a certain drop in megawatts, then you have to have some baseline to keep track of it. I agree with you, the better way is, is you actually have the real-time telemetry. But what I think what we're an energy-only market, so what I'd rather do is I'd like to expose more and more of the demand to a real-time price signal and then I don't really need a demand response program. I just need them to react if the price gets to a point where they want to do something different yeah. with the real-time metering so we know what's happening. So one thing I did want to touch on at some point, um, just when we look at the potential to open up that wholesale market as a, an additional value stream or as a baseline, depending on how things go. You mentioned yesterday, I think it was 21 states have some type of major rate reform or net, uh, net metering reform going on, or docket going on necessarily. Reform won't necessarily happen based on a docket, but looking at that, there's uncertainty, you know, five years, seven years out for solar developers, or if you're solar plus storage and you fit it into the NEM, NEM uh, uh, arrangement that's there right now, getting, uh, wholesale structures that are in place three years from now, four years from now, is that something that provides some uh, some kind of insurance for solar providers getting out there and uh, kind of a, a new way to actually 
kind of re potentially replace traditional value streams that may be going away or reducing? I think it's a... You're, you're I got a stare at, down from me. Stare down, <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's, it's good to know that that's out there in the future as an, I mean, at the end of the day, all kind of the financing and everything, all you're looking at kind of the, the more revenue streams, the more certainty, the better, right? And so uh, the, the fact that there are things like being able to participate in the wholesale market are out there that are coming, that's great. Um, it'll be interesting to see, again, this is another crystal ball question. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how it plays out with net metering. Right, right now, if I'm, I'm, I'm residential and I have net metering, then I, what's my incentive to actually participate in the wholesale market? Mm -hmm. uh, if that changes and now uh, that goes away, then that's an additional revenue stream. Uh, how does the distribution assets and distribution services actually play into that? So I, 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 I think it, it is good, right? I mean, at the end of the day, there's an additional revenue stream that is potentially coming down the road that's always good to have. The question becomes how certain is it and how does that compare to what we have today? Everyone has a feeling that net metering is changing and already states have kind of changed it significantly and most of the others are looking at changing it. I think it truly becomes kind of a, which one do I participate in? That becomes the question. Yeah. But I don't think anybody's counting on any of these new value streams now. I mean, a lot yeah. will have to happen in the next you know, yeah. two, three, four years before people start putting it into their financial models. Well, it's a good chance it's not going to be the only thing. You can't just rely on an energy market, That's most right. likely, at least, for a residential system or even a CNI system. So, makes sense. Um, one thing I'm actually curious about, Joel, from a, from a switching side, if we have an asset that's moving around, I know some of the stuff that's come out very early from you guys is potentially getting these into the ancillary services market, not just in the energy market. Um, with ERCOT, switching between different markets how is that going to actually be affected if you're talking about whole classes of assets? Is it something that you guys are expecting, you know, three-month contracts, one-week contracts, day ahead? How can people kind of optimize moving into where there's a need? Um, well, I don't think ERCOT would be the one that would have a contract with, with any of these providers. I think we're just going to set up. We need to know where the physical location is, what we call the easy ID or the electric service ID mm -hmm. of the, the device. So we can, our network model knows where it's at, knows what it can do. But the financial part of it will be still the, what we call the retail electric providers uh, will be uh, either dealing with these one-on-one -on -one or aggregating them up into products that then they will then bid in into our market. So um, I guess I'm saying that it won't really, it'll be kind of transparent to us. Now we will have to look at, uh, you know, we do have a philosophy that if we're buying something, we get a actually expect to get that service. Mm -hmm. So we'll have to have um, rules around that of how we can be convinced that we actually got what we bought. Because uh, just like demand response, it, you, you can pay for it for a year and never need it. And then the one time you need it, they don't perform. And, and you kind of pay them for a whole year for something that arguably they've never provided. So that will have to be worked out. I don't think we've gone down those details. But the key is that we won't be, we won't have a contract with that supplier We'll have a contract with, uh, with our, the, the lowest entity that we deal with is a qualified scheduling entity mm -hmm. that will be, they'll be on the, on the plate to make Well, sure even in that do. case, them moving around their assets, you know, we have, here they're looking at, I believe, you can have a mixed bag of assets if it's in one, ske one single node zone, a nodal zone. If it's across multiple nodal zones, it has to be one class of assets. It has to all move in the same direction. Those types of... I mean, basically, baskets of assets that will be, it's likely that these providers will have multiple baskets just because of that, those types of rules. Actually having those baskets be able to say, okay, I'm an energy storage asset. In the next two hours, we're, there's a plant dropping out, so we need to be there for ancillary services, or we're expecting major cloud cover, so we need to be there for ancillary services. Those prices are going to be good. Let's move from, um, from, the energy, uh, from doing demand charge management to being in the ancillary services market for the next hour. Because um, those are things that have to be certain. I mean, you have to say, if, if I'm there for an hour, I'm there for an hour. You can move me up, down, otherwise, right? Those types of adjustments, those types of quick things, and it's early, right, to be able to say for sure. But how, how easy are you expecting these things to be able to move between things because of flexibility from things like storage? Yeah, I think um, 
you know, again, we're coming from our perspective as an ISO, um, not the energy service provider that yeah. wants to have that maximum flexibility. I'm not sure we're going to agree on that they can switch every hour and we can keep track of that and, and be assured of, of uh, getting what we paid for. Um, I think I see the battery storage, you know, they might have used, they might have packaged up a bunch of uh, batteries from around the system to hedge against some energy price, and that's mm -hmm. fine, they can do that. But again, I want to give each one of those batteries a different price, a nodal mm -hmm. price, based on what they can actually do in real time for me. And there's, you know, kind of a contract for differences, I think, that the, the um, QSC or the retail electric provider can still deal with, where they can dispatch a battery nodally, but it's still providing them a hedge against, you know, whatever the real time or day ahead prices are. Yeah. But again, that's not my focus, so I, I could be saying that all wrong. Yeah. Uh, when it comes to ancillary services, um, you know, I, I'm not sure how valuable it's going to be to um, put 100,000 individual customers together to give, you know, ERCOT a half a megawatt of regulation. I, I'm, I'm thinking that might still be more cost effective from a traditional generator, but, you know, I'm not going to predict that that's true or not true. If, it, if the economies come down to, to make it cheaper to do that, it will happen. Again, we're going to be agnostic to the technology, and we're just going to be looking for the bid. And if the bid's cheaper, we'll take that bid, provided we can be convinced that we're actually getting that service. Yeah. I think, the, the, just if, if I may, the, the, the way to think about it is also, I agree with kind of there's a, there's a certain kind of size benefit scaling issue, right? But part of the way I think to also think about this is a lot of these assets are going to be put on the grid. And, you know, you guys or a utility are not necessarily, I mean, you're not paying additional right. for it. And so then it is just how can you tap into that marginal value, right. which may not or which may be more competitive with when you're looking at it kind of generate or provide. Right. right. So it is not kind of the how do I kind of pay for all these assets, but these assets are there. Right. I mean, that's what kind of the way Hawaii is looking at it. We have lots of it on the grid. How can I get more out of it and then compensate that? At that point, it can be pretty cost effective. Yep, that makes sense. Yep. And then the hard work becomes educating the customer and allowing them to control those assets in a particular way. Right? Yeah, you need a rate structure or some market mechanism for With, that, right? Without, as I think, I think you were the one who said on Monday, without having a conversation about bars across the kitchen table because it doesn't really go very far. <laughs> no, that's, that's when an aggregator or some sort of a system provider needs to because it is it has to become very, very simple to the, to the homeowner where you say, look, the utility or the system provider will tap into it. Here is kind of the, you won't see any loss of production or here is kind of the mechanics of it and here's a $10 check a month or whatever it is, right? Uh, yeah, I, I would rather not talk reactive par with every homeowner. Yeah. Um, so we have a little bit of time for questions from the audience. Uh, I got a couple runners around, so. With that, uh, <laughs> uh, let's see here. What can I throw out that's tough? Well, let me just say, let me let me add one thing on when you look at your uh, list of tough questions. I think they're on page two. Yeah, they are. Um, right <laughs> but uh, I did want to mention, you know, the, the interesting thing while I'm sitting here listening to the conversation, the invisible hand of the free market begins to solve this problem, right? We, we're having an interesting conversation a little bit about the cost benefit of does it make sense to aggregate 100,000 customers to create an ancillary service? I don't know. You don't know. But the market will figure it out. And if it does make economic sense, somebody will go try and do it, right? Um, and, and I think that's what you, you, you certainly are sitting in a position where you're saying whatever we provide as a product, we have to have the reliability, we have to have the predictability and the capability that we need in order for us to operate the electric system. But beyond that, the market will begin to sort out, you know, who's going to play and who's not going to play in those different markets. I do want to mention that in a market like PJM, where we're very active, you know, the, the ancillary services market there is an hour ahead market. So you can come in and out of that market, frankly, however you want on an hour ahead basis. But oh, by the way, you better perform within the hour that you bid. Like if you don't perform, there's... There certainly are those, you know, reliability. I'm only going to pay you for what you deliver me, and if you excurge beyond what you told me you could do, uh, there's going to be there's potential penalties. You can get kicked out of the market, uh, as an example. So, um, 
but you can play that game of, you know what, it's more cost effective for me to do maybe uh, peak demand management right now for the next three hours, but at six o'clock in the evening, I don't need to do that anymore as a building. I can go play in the ancillary services market. Those, those constructs exist. So, as we go into tough questions, um, partitioning particular assets, and that may be a building having multiple assets, or maybe a storage system uh, saying they're gonna provide X amount for their internal process and Y amount for, um, for an ISO or for distribution services. I'm curious thoughts on just from any of you actually on how, when and how that actually comes up. Because we've been talking about stackable benefits for a long time. Most of the time, uh, I've only seen about two or three programs where that's actually been even piloted or started to get through. I think there's one with PG&E uh, and IRM uh, two, I think, right, with STEM and the PG&E working on demand charge management, as well as some, I think, frequency regulation, as well as DTE with some, uh, what was it, uh, MISO capacity markets, uh, MISO, yeah, capacity markets and uh, reliability. Is that something you guys are expecting down the pike in conversations you're having uh, with ISOs or distribution utilities for grid services? How comfortable are they with you know, taking a few percentage points from a bunch of different resources, or a particular resource is large enough in PGM, for instance, if it's a three megawatt battery, partitioning out a third of it or half of it for services to the grid? I think it's a, from a, I think, again, I, I can speak for kind of what, what we do at Enphase and what, what I've seen, and I think technology exists and it's possible, right? I mean, we can, we can give you bit individual panels on a, on a roof if, you, if, if we wanted to get that granular. Mm -hmm. uh, I think most of the technology providers now are getting to the point where uh, it isn't a house that's doing it, right? But you can have my solar doing something and my storage asset can actually bid separately. My load <coughs> can do something separately. I think the question more kind of gets towards from a, from a ISO level or a regulatory level, uh, how do we get you guys comfortable that, like you said, if, if you're committing that, doesn't matter if it's the whole house or if it's part of the house or whatever it is, but if you're committing to it, can you deliver again? So to me, that's the, that's the main question. Right. And the, it's, a, it's an interesting and challenging question as well because if we're, you know, we're gonna maintain this discussion to customer-sided resources and the customer side of the meter, uh, you know, there, there's not only the, the you know, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of these programs are pilot programs. So, you know, in, in my role working for an engineering procurement and construction firm, you know, we are the last people that touch a project before we hand over the keys. And we're typically handing the keys over to the final asset owner. I'm, like, I'm excited about the next forum or the next uh, panel that's gonna talk about storage financing. Uh, you know, we work with a lot of uh, Final asset owners uh, who are typically either financing houses or, you know, or you know, uh, folks that are going to own and, and realize the the savings or the tax benefit, you know, one way or the other. And when we when we talk about this kind of customer sided resource conversation, you know, we are having customers call us, you know, almost every day, saying, you know, we we want to build, you know, we're going to build something new. Uh, you know, we're going to build a new solar project. We're going to build a new facility. Can you show us how the economics work on making an investment, you know, into this, these new resources that we're, um, you know, that we're hearing about? And there are no standardized economic models that exist today to show a customer how they might, you know, see the return on the investment of the device that they, that they put on their site. I mean, one of my challenges I would say to the audience is if, you know, if, if, uh, if folks can come to the market with, you know, standardized tools to help th that, that everyone can agree upon, you know, uh, uh, show the measurements, show the metrics for returns, like that would be really good. You know, I'm, I'm waiting to see the PV SYST equivalent, uh, PV SYST report equivalent of, you know, from solar in, in the energy storage or in the other uh, DERS, DERMS market in, yeah. in technologies. Well, it's just a lot tougher because the markets are so different space to space and talking about trying to find locational pricing when, to my understanding, no one's gotten anywhere near locational pricing at a feeder level implemented. Right. Implemented. Um, there are some technologies out there that are looking at that, but 
to be able to actually price that and understand that before we get to that is, you know, we're just early. Well, it's, it's a multivariable differential equation that we solved in solar, but it was very challenging to solve in solar, and I feel like the, you know, it's an order to uh, uh, more complexity, you know, order to the magnitude more complexity when we start talking about storage and DERS. Yeah. So we got about five minutes. I don't know if we got one question over here. There is a question. Uh, not a question I'm actually expecting anybody to have a an answer to, but I'm interested in getting um, all of your perspectives. And that's um, around the, the, the tension, or it could be a tension, between sort of optimizing um, operation for what the bulk system needs um, versus the impact of operating distributed assets um, on the distribution system. So as an example of that, let's say for the sake of argument, you're doing frequency regulation deep into the distribution system with a lot of resources on a single line, and now you're all moving them up and down simultaneously. It's not necessarily the best thing for that feeder. Um, so what, what do you see as the role of the distribution system operator in enabling that transaction or, or in co-optimizing those transactions? It's kind of curious to see your perspective on that. Can I start with one or two things? So, I, because I got to say things that you guys don't, because I got to be a little bit less PC. I'll take a stab <laughs> at it. I will say, I have to admit, I think Carl, you and I have had this conversation a couple of times, and I don't, I mean, just, I don't have a great answer because it's a, that's a, it's an enormously tough problem as you, as you just accurately described. You're manipulating an asset here to create this market opportunity, but there's this guy in the middle, the distribution network, whatever it is, or the, the utility that's sitting in the middle that's kind of getting moved around all the time as a result of that. And if the asset is big enough, you could certainly cause some, some interesting challenges for them. Um, I guess I would give you know, a couple of thoughts as to how you help mitigate that. Um, one is, uh, you'll hear me say this a lot, so I apologize, this is kind of part of our story, is that is where the power of the network comes into play. Because while you're manipulating assets in one part of the network, you do need to be manipulating assets in a different direction, perhaps, in another part of the network. And I think you can begin to sort of optimize at multiple layers. Um, the real problem is where's the injection point for the optimization set points within all of that? Does it come from the distribution network provider or, does it, or do you have to uh, interpolate it, if you will, and try and operate around some special point? Um, I think we will find, as New York particularly begins to evolve much more, I think actually those are going to be some of the more interesting challenges is how that sorts out, where the different layers of the optimization that actually gets built, because you have to basically do optimization at multiple levels within it. But I think the answer is build a big network. Um, and when you build a big network of flexible assets, you have the ability to, to handle those, those uh, changes, if you will, that, that need, to be, need to be considered. Sorry, I don't have a perfect answer for you, though. <laughs> so I actually want to add on to that. When you look at the distribution side, there's, I mean, there's 800 considerations. That's why when you look at planning tools, you look at understanding what you can actually put online, what needs to be put onto it to mitigate potential complications. But to bring up a few points, uh, one, you almost need, which we do for a load oftentimes, there's alerting on SCADA systems when there's just too much, uh, too much power running through a substation. Sometimes there's shutdowns or there's, if they're lucky, there's targeted demand response in that one area, and that's, I say if they're lucky, I mean that's very rare uh, for feeder by feeder demand response um, or a, a derms to be involved or something like that um, at the moment. But to be able to do that loading, understand that with reactive power, understand the voltage, and keep all those pieces together, you're talking about bringing in many, many different systems, those connections having to be real time, and it's just an extremely complex problem. And you add on to that, difficulties with, if you're talking about optimizing the system from the technical perspective, EMSs and DMSs and regulated utilities with everything across the board oftentimes are split for security reasons. Um, they can be put together. They can have a co-optimization on the, not necessarily the market side, not the financials, but just even the technical side, which has to come first, right? So it's hard to bring those two worlds together and make sense of anything, and you almost to, to bring it up a little bit, you almost need essentially think of like a, a BMS, the internal logic around a battery management system. It's there to say that, yeah, I could add a little bit more power right now, but I'll blow the system up. And you need to be able to do that feeder by feeder, which is something we haven't done beyond a few simple constraints. 
for reasons of not having the money to do it, because you don't want to raise rates a lot in the process. We could over-engineer everything if we wanted, but keeping those costs down while putting a system in is hard. So I think we touched maybe 10% of that question. Well, is, it, I mean, that's a tough question. Yeah, yeah. but it's also quickly. You, you, got, page, you got to page three, Carl. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's, it's, we haven't truly taken a step back and holistically defined what are we trying to solve here, right? I mean, it's just not, not to be kind of glib about it, but I mean, sure, we can now take all these assets and, and, and put them into kind of the capacity markets, but is that really kind of the most burning problem we're trying to solve? Or if you manage the voltage issue and now you can put twice, 10 times more uh, distributed assets on it, do you now have solved a certain part of the capacity market anyways? Right, so it, it, we, we're kind of piecing it up and saying let's solve, to, but it's connected and I don't think there's been a holistic look at, we have to get to that point of saying what truly are we trying to solve and if we, Normalize one, do we kind of help or hurt the other, which is, I, I don't think anyone's, anyone's taken a look at it. And so we're a little bit over, but I want to make one comment on that. It's very similar to what we were talking about in the reliability panel yesterday. When you look at something like Rev, it's DERS, 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 locational value, capacity markets, et cetera, et cetera. And then the last line is, oh, and it's going to improve reliability. And that's the one thing within this, you know, you always have to remember at that last step, once you say, yeah, can we fix the capacity markets? But for ISOs, getting visibility, if you're talking about Hawaii penetrations, which most places aren't going to have necessarily that chunk of residential is the only solar penetration or the only, uh, or the main uh, renewable penetration. But having windows into what's actually being put out, yeah. at least that awareness is going to be required one way or another. Yeah. So, yeah. Anyways, we're a little bit over. So uh, just a round of applause for our panelists.